You may be asking yourself, why do you care what kind of quarter notes existed in music from 1450? And that's a really reasonable question. So let's start by understanding what theorists do. Theorists look back at music that's popular, and they say, what made that music work? Why is it popular? What did people want to hear? What were the things that composers imitated when they heard other composers? And that gives us an insight into how music works. Sometimes the way it works is only particular to that time period, and sometimes those things actually carry on through all of Western music. We find out sort of fundamental to the way that we in the tradition out of Europe think about music. So it's really valuable, and there's a lot of things we couldn't know when we look at individual pieces, but computers have given us so much power. So like I said last video, you suddenly have this ability to take any piece of music, convert it to MIDI data, and you can do it just by scanning the music, and lots of programs will turn to MIDI data. Those are off-on switches. They're just ones and zeros. So a computer can analyze it, and they can look at everything. They can look at what intervals are common, what rhythms are common, what dissonances are common, how they resolve, how they're different in Spain versus Italy versus France versus the Flemish composers in the lowlands. They can do tons of stuff. And it's amazing. So we're going to just get some of those insights. So if any of you decide to do music theory, <coughs> you can choose to study this stuff. If you love computers and you love music, it's an amazing world that opens up. And it's not just the Renaissance. You could do the same thing with the music of 1920 or the music of 1950 or 1890. You can do it for jazz. You can do it for classical music. You can do it for rock and hip-hop. All of this stuff is MIDI data. All of it can be analyzed, and we can tell us what works, what doesn't work, what people like to hear, what, compute, what composers found exciting. So... There's a whole bunch of rules they discover in this book, and we don't really care. You can look them up when you do your homework to say, oh, that's interesting. That's what's wrong there. That's why that doesn't sound like Renaissance music. But I'll give you the basics that are important. Melodies in the Renaissance were mostly stepwise. About a third of the time, people would skip, but the skips tended to be small. Why? Written for singers and written for amateur singers. These were monks. So large skips are hard. And also they found it much more graceful if they jumped up to something if they came back, usually by step, in the opposite direction. If you went down, you'd come back up, usually by step, sometimes by third. So if I go da, 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 you know, you go up, you come down. And you go down, you come up. You don't tend to have two skips, particularly skips bigger than a third in a row. Just not done. You go up, you go down. So that's one thing, and that's only, you only skip about a third of the time, and the rest of it's basically stepwise, and those are how the melodies work. Rhythms are also kind of interesting. We notate these things today with a two on the bottom, half note getting the beat. That's sort of the standard. It's hard to know because they didn't have measures or anything in the Renaissance, so the notation has to be converted to modern notation. But traditionally, you write it with a two at the bottom and either a four or a three at the top. So it's either four two time or three two time. And because two, the half note is the beat, what does that mean? Well, you see some pairs of eighth notes. They're off the beat. They're just ornaments. They're never on strong beats. They're one, ba, ba, ba. Otherwise, it's quarters through the brev. Remember, the brev is two half notes tied together. So you see some brevs, but basically half note, a, um, half note, whole note, half note, quarter note, and some ornamented eighth notes. And then you'll see in the book there's all these kinds of rules, like if you have a half note, you can tie it across a bar line to another half or to a quarter, but nothing shorter and nothing longer. So you tend to tie to the same value or to one less. So a half note can become a dotted half. That's really a tie to a quarter, but it's not going to tie to an eighth. A whole note can become a dotted whole note that's tied to an eighth note. It can become a brev that's tied to a, tied to a half note, tied to another whole note, but it's not going to be anything smaller than that. So there's a couple of rules when things move off the beat. You know, and that's true of rest, too, and you'll see it in your book. I actually don't care that you know the details, although there's one assignment where that's open book where you can look up the details. don't really care so much. What I care about is that you understand that any group of music has these hidden patterns. You know, Mozart did these appoggiatures all over the place. What beats do they happen on? What voice do they happen on? What, how big is the leap when he does it? Well, that computers can find out, and then you begin to get this... The, quintessential Mozart sound. It's just a pattern he loved. Did other composers imitate him or not? Look at Beethoven. Does he do the same thing? Throw it in the computer and find out. 
We can learn so much about music this way. So even though we're looking at music that unless you're um, a choral specialist, you're probably not going to do a lot of. And frankly, even if you are a choral specialist, you can do it beautifully without knowing these details. But knowing that we can look deeply into music and find out what makes it tick, that to me is interesting. And I hope you find it equally interesting as we look at the, the melodies and the rhythms and the rests. Is there something else I'm supposed to tell you about? I don't think so. Rhythm and meter, that's enough. Take a look to see if there's anything I'm skipping. Ah, cadences. So let's do cadences at the same time. You don't have chords. You don't have five going to one. So you don't have perfect authentic cadences. But you have something that's very similar. There's something called the called the clausula vera, the true close. And that's really the equivalent of a... Um, of a perfect authentic cadence. The soprano voice or so is usually going to go by ste either step down or step up to the, um, the tonic of that mode. The bass is going to go to the tonic of that mode. Now the bass is going to move stepwise if there's only two voices. But if there's more than two voices, the bass will often go 5-1 or sometimes 4-1 depending on the mode. Some places you have a tritone there, you can't do it. And then the middle is going to fill in by a middle voice. So it looks very, very, very much like um, a perfect authentic cadence. Not identical, but it is a very similar thing. This is the beginning of chords evolving. It's this clausula vera, clausula vera. There we go. They also have things where if you, you go from what looks like a four chord to a five, in other words, you're jumping not five one, but four one in the bass. And those are plagal cadences, just like they are in tonal music. Um, and you get an awful lot of other weirdnesses in there. Like you get sometimes where there really isn't a cadence, but but there's a stop where every time you have a new line of text, you put a rest and have another line of text. And those rests will sort of hock it. They'll come one after another. And they'll give a feeling of a pause or a stop. We call that a weak cadence. Usually it's more rhythmically determined or textually determined because there's one line of text per phrase. Um, but otherwise, we see these other plagals and um, and other kinds of cadences that are very much like the tonal cadences. We'll get used to them, and we'll just watch them evolve until soon we have 5-1 and 4-1, just like we have today. That's sort of cool. All right, more to come.